Chris, can I trouble you for a favour? I need to borrow something of yours for an experiment. Is that OK? Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Hang on, trouble me for what? Some of your blood? You've got eight pints of it. Absolutely not. I'm using mine at the moment. Yeah, but this is a once-in-a-lifetime chance to get it on telly. Ooh, this does sound good, actually. Great. Now, remember, we can only do this because we're doctors. Now, you might think I'm being brave with this needle, but you've got to remember that needles don't hurt unless you think they hurt, and I don't think it hurts. Nice work, Zand. I have to say, though, for all the vital jobs it does, like carrying oxygen around my body, it's not much to look at, is it? I mean, it's just sort of red and gloopy, right? Wrong! It is much to look at, but only if you put it in one of these. This is a centrifuge machine. This is my centrifuge machine. I've been looking for that. Stop interrupting. We're trying to do an experiment. By spinning Chris's blood around at high speed, the centrifuge machine will separate the different parts that make up blood so we can see them. And ten minutes later... So there we go. Now, this top liquid layer is called the plasma, and it carries nutrients around your body and also carries waste material that your body wants to get rid of. And underneath the plasma, you can see this red layer, and that is made up of red blood cells, or erythrocytes, and these carry oxygen all around your body. And also in there are the platelets, and those are the cells that help you form blood clots. And right between these two layers, you can see a little bit of cloudiness. Those are white blood cells to fight infection. Well, there we go, Chris. We're all done with that now. Why are you giving me this? I only needed to borrow it. I'm a man of my word. So you've seen what your blood is made up of. But do you know where your blood comes from? Well, we're going to show you. Gross alert coming up. Amazingly, your blood comes from your bones. If you thought your bones were just solid, hard, white things that kept you standing up, then think again, because there's more to bones than that. Now, to demonstrate this, I've got a pig's femur. That's the big bone that you've got in your thigh. And we're going to open this one up to see how bones make blood. The femur is one of the strongest bones in the body, so we're going to need some very specialist kit to cut it open. Exactly. Right, Zand. Or we could use a medical femur saw. It's the only thing that doctors ever, ever use to cut bones. OK, we'll do it your way. It's time to saw open some bone. Chris the saw. Get ready, because this is going to be a bit messy. This is the inside of a pig's femur. And right here, this squishy stuff is red bone marrow. Now, it's the red bone marrow that makes all your blood cells. In fact, every single day, your bone marrow makes 500 billion blood cells. Busy. Now, the inside of your bones looks like this. It's pink with a lot of red marrow. But as you get older, your marrow starts to turn yellow. Chris, the yellow bone marrow, coming right up. This is the inside of an adult cow's leg bone. This yellow bone marrow is a much lighter colour. It's very soft and squidgy, and that's because it's mostly fat cells. And this is what your mum and dad's bone marrow looks like. And that's because your body needs more blood when it's growing a lot. But as you get older and you don't have so much growing to do, some of the red marrow, which makes blood, turns to yellow marrow, which is basically a fat store. So you have more red marrow than a grown-up. But how does blood get from inside the bones to flowing around your body? Well, we're going to show you. Come and have a good look at this. Right there, between that bit of bone marrow and the hard bit of bone, is a blood vessel. So that's coming right inside your bones to pick up all that nice new blood being made by the marrow every single day. How cool is that? So we've shown you that inside, your bones are amazing blood-making factories and veins come right inside the bones to pick up that blood. And we've seen that blood is made up of different things, all of which have different jobs in your body. You know, Chris, I did have a sense that that chainsaw was a bit over the top. Did you, Zand? I could feel it in my bones. Ouch!
As a doctor, my specialty is tropical medicine, and it takes me all over the world. But actually, one of the best places to study it is right here in the UK, at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And I'm going to show you what they keep in the basement. Because some countries have tropical warm temperatures, they're just the right conditions for disease-spreading animals to thrive and multiply. In this room are 8,000 of one of the deadliest animals in the world. And no, this is not a tank full of great white sharks. These are sexy flies. Oh! Setsi flies live in 35 countries across Africa. When they bite a human, they cause a fatal disease called sleeping sickness by injecting a nasty parasite. This laboratory in Liverpool is trying to find a cure to help millions of people. This is Dr Alvaro Acosta Serrano. He's the chief scientist who looks after the flies, and they're hungry. He's just served up some blood for them to feed on so he can research their habits. This is a special sheet that's heated so the flies think it's real skin. Underneath the skin is animal blood, and so the flies bite through the skin and drink the blood as they would in real life. Look at those bellies. They're red because they're full of blood. Lovely. How often do you have to feed the flies? Every other day. Every other day. So you've basically got 8,000 pet flies in the basement that need feeding every two days. That is a lot of work. So I thought I'd help out Dr Alvaro and feed one of the flies by letting it bite me right now. But don't worry, these flies are sterile, which means they don't carry any disease. So this fly is sucking up my blood through its proboscis, that long straw-like thing at the front. So how much blood is he going to drink? It's going to take at least twice his own weight. Twice his own weight. OK, so that is the equivalent of me drinking 300 pints of milk for breakfast. So while he's eating, he's leaving a sort of substance on my arm. What is that? It's just getting rid of the waste of the, from, from blood. So I'm not just being eaten, this fly is also having a poo on me. Nice. And look at how much its body has grown in just five minutes. It's full of my blood. And if this was a wild fly and it was carrying the parasite, it could make me very sick indeed. This green and yellow stuff is blood under a special microscope. But see those wriggly worm things? They're the parasites that the setsy fly injects. And those parasites multiply in the bloodstream and make the patient feel extremely unwell. And then they move to the central nervous system, to the brain, where they multiply further. The patient feels drowsy, increasingly sleepy, and over the course of weeks to a month, they die. That's why it's so important that the team study the flies and find out more about the parasites to stop them from causing people harm. At the moment, there's no vaccine to prevent sleeping sickness, and the only way they can keep the disease at bay is by setting up giant fly traps. So the investigation for Dr Alvaro and his team must continue. My experience with sexy flies here in Liverpool has been fascinating. Even being bitten was quite fun. But in Africa, they spread one of the most fatal diseases known to man. And that's why the work done by Alvaro and his team is so important. Chris, give me your hand. Why? I'm about to use a special piece of medical equipment on you, and I can only do this because I'm a doctor. Why do I feel nervous? Ouch! You've drawn blood! Is this really necessary? Now, don't try anything like this at home. And I'm only tolerating it because Zand is a trained medical professional and he's using some piece of proper scientific equipment. Now, the reason I pierced Chris's skin was to show you how blood is absolutely everywhere inside your body. It's true that while it did hurt, the hole actually couldn't be any smaller. Blood still came out. Our bodies are filled with five litres of blood and it flows through an incredible network of tiny vessels. As you'll know, if you've ever cut yourself on paper, even the tiniest cut draws blood. That's because blood vessels are everywhere in your body. You have about 60,000 miles of them, enough to go around the planet nearly two and a half times. Now, Zahn, wait here. Give me your hand. Now, I want you to take the end of this piece of string, start walking, and keep walking. Now, the string that Zand is holding represents the blood vessels in just one part of your body. So, do you think that all this string represents the amount of blood vessels in A, your arm, B, your hand, or C, just your fingertip? The answer is C. Amazingly, 
all this string is the same length as the blood vessels in just one fingertip. Your fingertip is only about one centimetre long, but the blood vessels inside it measure a thousand metres. So, that's how long this string is. And I suppose, by now, how far away is on this? Chris? Chris? I suppose better get him back. So, there are thousands of blood vessels in your body carrying blood to and from the heart to keep everything working. And you have two types, arteries and veins. So take a look at this. It's a device that doctors use for spotting veins and it has a special infrared light. Chris, meet my veins. Look at that. Cool, that really is good. I mean, you can see Zahn's veins in all their glory. And the job of those veins is to carry your blood back to your heart. Now, your other blood vessels are your arteries, and they take blood from your heart to your muscles and organs. This is a piece of skin from a pig. It might look disgusting, but we're showing it to you because it has arteries in it, just like yours. They're thick, and they're tough, and elastic, and they're very strong. Now, next to them are the veins, but they're much harder to see, they're much smaller, and they're much floppier. Now, the reason the arteries are so strong is because blood is pushed out from the heart and very high pressure, but the whole system relies on blood vessels being nice and clear. Like roads, they work better when they're not blocked with traffic. And to show you what happens when arteries are blocked, I've enlisted the help of some of my friends. Chris, meet John and Anita. They're wooden cutouts. They look a lot like John and Anita. Anyway, they both have tubes running all over their bodies, and those represent arteries. Now, the arteries on Anita are lovely and clear. With John, though, there are little blockages all over the place. It doesn't look like a big deal, but we're going to try and show you how much difference this makes in an artery race. In 30 seconds, we're going to see how much of our fake blood, in my case blue, in Zan's case green, we can pump through the blood vessels to John and Anita's organs. Basically, we're going to be their hearts. Start the clock. No, oh, mine's really difficult. John's arteries are so blocked that no blood is getting to his muscles or his organs. I'm having to put in loads of pressure, and this is like John having high blood pressure, isn't it? On the other hand, Anita is extremely easy. Chris, Anita's doing fine, but John's in real trouble. John's hemorrhaging, and I'm hardly getting anything through to the bucket. You've got to keep pumping or he's going to die. John is not doing well. Time's up. Terrible. And no blood is getting to his organs. Well, Zond, I did all I could, but it just goes to show how serious a blockage in an artery can be. It's lucky John is only a cutout. If you want to have nice, clear arteries like Anita, you've got to exercise, eat properly, and lead a healthy lifestyle. Now, Chris, I've got a ball of string that represents all the blood vessels in your entire body. It's 60,000 miles long. Tie the end to your finger. Zond. Not falling for that trick, but that is an enormous ball of string. Ouch. This is a leech, and it's a type of worm. Whereas we only have one brain, a leech has 32. And while we have 32 teeth, a leech has 125. Their main diet is blood. And in fact, right now, I'm providing lunch for this one. Whilst it's on my arm, it's going to eat five times its own body weight in my blood. That's the equivalent of me eating a small cow, hooves and horns and everything. It's not just greedy, it's disgusting. But these wrigglers can actually save human lives, all by sucking our blood. To get drinking, this leech has bitten me, and now its saliva is working its way into my veins, releasing a chemical which will thin my blood, preventing it from clotting. And it's this ability to get our blood flowing that surgeons use in modern medicine. So let's say you chop off the end of your finger. A surgeon can attach the finger, but if blood clots have formed inside the bit of dead finger, new blood can't get in and it will fall off. What doctors can now do is attach a leech to the tip of the finger, and the same chemicals that allow my blood to flow into the leech on my arm dissolve the clots and allow fresh blood to enter the reattached finger. There's no fancy machine or drug that can do this job as successfully as a leech. And with such an important medical role, leeches are bred on a massive scale. So while this one has a good feed on me, let's go and meet some more. This is Carl Peters Bond. He's a leech breeding king, 
and it's currently housing 30,000 of these wrigglers. How do they breed? Well, the leeches are a male and female, so they can fertilise themselves. So sort of boys on one section, a girls on the other, and, then, and they sort of breed together. So when two leeches mate, they both get pregnant, which is pretty extraordinary. And wait till you meet their babies. This is a leech nest. When the leeches lay their eggs, it looks just like white form, and then it settles down to a sort of a sponge. So this is made by the leeches, and you can just see the clear space at the top, and then the leeches have settled to the bottom. I'm just going to cut the lid off. It is full of wriggling leeches. This is like the world's worst Easter egg, isn't it? Yeah. That's so fascinating, I'm completely distracted from how disgusting it is. And I'm completely distracted with the fact I've still got this enormous leech feeding off my arm. What's going to happen when he's full? Uh, well, it's just going to drop off, and then the hole it makes will just keep oozing blood for ten hours. Ten hours? Great. No one told me that. That would have been nice to know. Well, after an hour and a half on my arm, it's finally full. And you can see how it's got the blood in my arm flowing. This is the point. If you've cut your finger off, if the surgeon's reattached the finger, it's the chemicals that are now making me bleed that allow new blood vessels and new blood to flow into the reattached finger. They may be greedy, they may be frankly disgusting, but it is that that means they are the most amazing healers. And you can see how much it's grown. It really is five times bigger. I look quite attached to that, literally. This is blood. It's not human blood, but it's almost exactly the same. Now, without blood, you'd be dead. That's because your organs need blood every second of the day to keep them working. So if someone's had an accident, the most important thing to do is stop the bleeding. Blood isn't just a liquid. It's actually full of red blood cells. And your body makes two million new red blood cells every second. And all these blood cells have a really important job. They carry oxygen from your lungs to all the cells in your body. When you breathe in air, it goes straight to your lungs and travels through little sacs called alveoli, and it's their job to transfer all the oxygen to your blood. When it goes into the lungs, it's this very dark, almost black, reddish colour. When it leaves the lungs, it changes colour and becomes a very bright red. Look at this vein in my hand. It looks bluish because it's full of dark-coloured blood that hasn't been to the lungs yet. I can show you the direction of flow in these veins. If I squeeze the blood out of this one, you see I've made it disappear, and then you can watch it refill from this end. And now it's on its way to get oxygen from the lungs, where it will change colour. Nice, isn't it? I can do exactly the same thing. And you notice, the other thing you see is how quickly it refills. So if you imagine the blood just feels like that, into that. It? So a red blood cell starting there will be back in my lungs really quickly. To show you what happens when your blood visits your lungs, we've got a piece of really high-tech equipment. So we're going to use this blender... That's my to blender. <laughs> we're going to use Chris's blender really? to whisk oxygen into the blood. Let's see what happens. This blood has started to form clots, so it's thick and lumpy cos it's outside the body. That's what happens to your blood when you get a cut. It reacts with the air to form a clot which glues the wound together, eventually becoming a scab. Right, now let's make a blood shake. By swirling it around quickly, the blender is putting oxygen into the blood. This is what happens when you take a deep breath. The oxygen is put directly into the blood and it makes it go a bright red colour. It's great. It looks like a blood smoothie. There's no such thing as a blood smoothie. It looks like a strawberry smoothie. Well, it's still your blender. Yeah, thanks for that. So we've shown you the way that blood goes from dark red with no oxygen in it to bright red and oxygenated. And that's what's happening in your body right now. All the new red blood cells are collecting oxygen from your lungs as you breathe and delivering it to every cell in your body. Ligaments are attached to your bones and they're strong and stretchy, but if they're stretched too far, they can tear. This is called a sprain. Ligaments tell your blood vessels they need help urgently because blood contains healing white blood cells. So it sends blood gushing to the sprain. The area swells up, protecting your vulnerable joint from moving. It gets hot too, so bacteria don't want to live there. But if it swells for too long, then scar tissue can build up. The only way to stop that is to keep it cool. 
Back inside, white blood cells get rid of the damage and new ligament cells arrive. After a few weeks, the ligaments get stronger, so you're back on your feet. Watch out! Oh, unlucky. Ouch. Blood. If you're sick and you need it, nothing else will do. The tricky bit is, there's only one way of getting hold of blood, taking it out of people. People like me. Around 4,000 litres of blood are used in hospitals all over England every day. It's vital for life-saving treatments, and that's why donations are so important. I'm just about to insert a needle into your arms, on. Yeah, so that's in. And actually, it really didn't hurt at all. You feel a bit of a scratch, and it's not a very nice idea, but Linda's a real expert, so it's, it's completely fine. And you're doing really well. They're all up and going. There it is, filling up. Now, your body is actually a blood factory. It's constantly making new blood. But it makes it in a place you might not expect, in the middle of your bones. In fact, our bodies can produce two million red blood cells every second. That's incredible. I'm donating about half a litre of blood, the equivalent of almost two cans of fizzy drink. That's around 13% of the blood circulating around my body. Now, you can't give blood until you're 17, but you can receive it, and it could save your life. That's me done, and it only took five minutes. It's going to come out now, OK, well done. Just keep pressure on there for us, OK, that's lovely. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. This is a bag of my blood, and sometime in the next 35 days, it's going to be put inside someone else, possibly saving their life but it can't go straight into them. First, it's got to go to the blood factory. This is the largest blood factory in the world, and we're going in. I've never seen anything like this. Behind me are 800 bags of live human blood. Wah! And John Kirkwood is here to tell me what's going to happen to my blood. Your blood will be one of 3,000 donations that we'll have taken from donors. So we're talking about a small swimming pool full of we blood are, yeah, we every are. day every coming day, in here. Yes. All the blood coming into the factory first gets put onto a giant rack where it's filtered to remove some of the cells which can't be used by every patient. What happens next? Well, then we take the pack round to what we call a manufacturing pod and then we will take out the plasma and the platelets and the red cells. The factory's job is to process and sort our blood into three main products which treat patients with different medical needs. The first product is red blood cells, which are often used for operations and transfusions. Then there are plasma and platelets. The darker liquid, plasma, contains proteins and cells to help patients fight diseases. Finally, platelets are tiny but important. They help blood clot and can be used for specialist bone marrow and cancer treatments. To split up the red blood cells from the plasma and platelets, the blood is put into here. It acts just like a big washing machine and spins around really fast, causing different cells to separate into three layers. Then a big press squeezes out the plasma and platelets, so you end up with them in bags up here and the red blood cells at the bottom. In a different part of the factory, a vital step in the processing is taking place testing. Every unit of blood that's donated has to be tested for two reasons. First, blood can carry diseases, and you really don't want to catch a disease from a blood transfusion. The second reason your blood needs to be tested is that just like people have different colour eyes or different colour hair, people actually have different kinds of blood. This is called blood groups, and you may have heard of them. There's A, there's B, there's AB, there's O. Now, if you get given the wrong kind of blood, this could be fatal, but don't worry, these guys are very good at what they do. These are the final products of this massive blood factory. Thousands of bags of living human blood, including mine, all going out to save lives. Because thousands of litres of blood are being used every day in the UK, it's vital that blood donations keep coming into the factory to be processed, ready to use in our hospitals. How much blood does an average adult heart pump around the body every day? Is it enough blood to fill approximately A, 100 teaspoons, B, 100 oil drums, or C, 100 Olympic swimming pools? The answer is B, 100 oil drums. That's around 23,000 litres of blood. 
Your body can need mending in all sorts of ways, and we're going to meet some special teams that are trained to fix you. Today's fix is all about blood. Some people are missing proteins in their blood that make it clot, which can make them bleed for longer. If they get a knock, they can bruise easily and can bleed inside joints too, where it can be very painful. Conditions like this, where the blood doesn't clot as easily, are called haemophilia, and with the right medication, they can be treated. Meet brothers Ben, Zach and Jake. They all have haemophilia, which is managed by injections of medicine. They have to come to the hospital every three months for a checkup with a team that are experts in haemophilia. Good morning. What can you tell me about haemophilia? Um, that if you injure yourself seriously, then um, it could lead to um, a big bleed. Mm -hmm. And what happens if you get a, a just a normal cut or a scratch? Um, I just got go and clean it and um, then carry on playing. And the medicine that you've injected keeps working in your body? Yeah. The injected medicine allows Jake's blood to clot properly and heal any cuts or bruises. This is Dr Granger and he's giving the boys their checkup today. Normal knobbly knees, no swelling on that. So they look like the, the normal shins of a ten-year-old boy, don't they? It's what I call healthy active boy bruises. Yeah. If he wasn't on his regular treatment, we would see very large sort of tennis ball sized bruises, which would often have sort of hard lumps in them, um, and they'd be a lot more black and blue. Now, this isn't Jake, and it might look a bit extreme, but even a small bruise can become a very big problem if the blood under the skin isn't stopped by medication. So the routine checkup is over, and it's back to school for the brothers. No pictures! Once you're 11, the clinic teaches you to inject the medicine yourself. Meet Mohammed. Have you ever had a big cut? Yeah, I, I can. Is that? I can see a very slight scar there on your forehead. There is. There. I was playing outside with my cousins, and then I went and fell on these rocks, and then I smashed my head. And when, when I went inside, I was panicking because I never knew what to do. So when Mohammed gets big cuts, he needs extra treatment. He needs more of his clotting factor, more of this special protein. Okay. Mohammed is going to show me how he injects his medicine. I mean, this is like you being your own doctor, nurse and TV star all at once, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right, doctor, yeah. carry on. So now you describe this like a plane coming into land. Yeah. And it does actually, these needles look a little bit like planes, don't they, with their wings? Now I have to just take off the, the elastic and now let me just flush all this in. As the medicine goes into the vein, it mixes with the blood to help it clot, which means he'll get a scab if he cuts himself, which is what the doctors want. So it's amazing watching Mohammed do this because I really want to help. Do you know what I mean, Mohammed? I really want to get involved and be like, no, because this is what I'd normally do. So it's, it's lovely to have a patient just do it to themselves. We do teach the boys uh, to do their injections when they're 10 and 11, and um, so that Mohammed can now go off and uh, go on school holidays and have trips out without mum worrying whether or not he's going to have a bleed whilst he's out and about. Yeah. For Jake, Zach, Ben and Mohammed, their blood doesn't clot as easily. But the treatment and training they get from the team here helps their bodies fix themselves. I mean, in the case of Mohammed, he's not just getting treatment, he's learning to treat himself. Is Mohammed going to put me out of a job?